Welcome. Welcome to Fearless with Jason Whitlock. I am Jason Whitlock, your host. Happy Friday. Happy Friday. We made it through the week. We're here. It's the conclusion of the week. We have an awesome show. I, you know what? Let me, let me backtrack. I hope we have an awesome show planned for you today. We're going to unpack this show different than we normally do at the insistence of our nearly comatose and brain dead producer, John Hadley, who had a good day yesterday and decided to double down. He decided to double down. Yesterday, we ended the show uh, with debating a young man, Joshua Alexander, over one of his approval rating scores. And so uh, that has filled John Hadley with a bit of confidence. And he has insisted from his nursing home bed in St. Louis, Missouri, uh, that we double down and, and unpack today's show a bit differently. According to John, uh, my fire starter, which we normally start the shows with, it, he, he, he says it's very good, but he thinks it's a little too heavy to start the show out with. Hey, why not start out on a lighter note, Jay? Uh, and so we're going to do that today, see how it goes. I do have a terrific uh, fire starter plan for today. It is a bit heavy. It's about, you know, the events here in Tennessee at the state capitol and at the House of Representatives here in, in, in uh, Nashville over, you know, gun violence, gun control, the Covenant school shooting. I'm going to get into that at the end of the show. Robbie Starbuck's gonna uh, gonna join us, and we're gonna talk about the the Tennessee three, two of which got expelled from the House. They'll circle back and be brought back in at some point, but we'll talk about that stuff, the heavier stuff, at the end of the show, because John Hadley thinks that we should start the show on a lighter note, a more upbeat note than that heavy discussion. Steve Kim's also going to be here. He'll be here in the middle of the show, uh, but uh, we're gonna go out on a limb here and take the advice of John Hadley. So what I would ask all of you all to do is pray for Hadley, because if this does not go well, uh, his days here uh, could be numbered for making such a silly suggestion that I, I put the fire starter at the tail end of the show. To just today, as we open on a, on a bit of a lighter note. And so what I want to do before we get into what could be a Hadley-inspired mess, I want to take care of uh, my favorite best friend, uh, the organization that gives this show and us direction and a purpose and inspiration. I want to tell you guys about Preborn before you know, we potentially make a mess of this show. Uh, you guys know what Preborn does and you know what we do for Preborn. We support Preborn because we have a mindset that life begins in the womb. We understand that and believe that because the Bible tells us so. He made us in his image while inside the womb. And so Preborn is one of the number one, if not the number one, organization fighting abortion culture and helping women choose life over abortion. When a woman gets an ultrasound, hears that baby's heartbeat, sees that baby in the womb, she is far more likely to choose life than abortion. Preborn provides free abortions to expectant mothers who are contemplating abortion. I think it's like 80% of the time when the woman sees that, hears that ultrasound, hears that heartbeat, sees the baby in the womb, she chooses life. It costs $28 per ultrasound, five ultrasounds, $140. We as fearless soldiers, because we know life begins inside the womb, have been supporting preborn. It's part of our mission. I love to get the emails from you guys telling me that uh, you've done it, that you've supported preborn. I got two or three more yesterday. 
This is part of our mission. This is one of the things we can do to fight the culture of death, the satanic culture of death. All of this stuff is connected. Everything that you're seeing going on in the world, the whole transgender nuttiness, all of it is connected to a mindset that doesn't value life inside the womb. It, it, it really is. I just want you to think it through. If you don't understand that life begins in the womb, how am I expected you to value life once it gets here outside the womb? Any of you that are parents know that the actions, the precautions, the steps you take while carrying a baby, talking to your baby while in the womb, eating the proper things while the baby is in the womb, peace and tranquility and, and, and a lack of tension, all important inside the womb. We know that you start caring for a baby inside the womb and the people that don't care for the baby inside the womb end up paying a price or end up costing that baby outside the womb. The, the, common sense, the science, everything tells you life begins inside the womb and it's important that we uh, support that life inside the womb and support women uh, in their early years of not, not just pregnancy, but in the development of that child. And that's where preborn comes in and uses their money to support that woman, to provide her that ultrasound, and then give her the support she needs the first two years of that baby's life so that she, the baby, gets off to a great start. So you guys know what we do. We, we pick up our phones, we dial pound 250, and we say the keyword baby. Or... We do it the Jason Whitlock way and we go preborn.com slash Jason. Preborn.com slash Jason. Be a loyal, obedient, fearless soldier. Hey, even if it's just $5 or $500 or $5,000, it all counts the same. It all helps you get in that mindset about where life begins, and you'll be amazed at how once you adopt that mindset, it will change your whole ap approach to life in all endeavors. Preborn.com slash Jason, pound 250, say the keyword, baby. Be a good, fearless soldier. All right, I I've, I've taken care of our partner here at Preborn. That's awesome. You guys know what to do. Uh, now, uh, if we could, just see you at home, uh, sitting there while you're hitting the likes button, while you're hitting the notifications and the subscribe button, while you're telling your friends to, hey, join the Fearless Army, watch this show. It's a great conversation for us to have. It, it's a great worldview. It's, it's, it's talking about all the issues in the world from a biblical point of view. It's an awesome show. While you're out promoting the show, while you're on Apple hitting that five-star review over and over and over again and telling your friends, hey, it's just a small thing. Hit that five-star review. While you're fighting the algorithm, say a little prayer for uh, John Hadley that this goes well. Uh, we're going to roll out uh, to uh, Todd Robinson. As we did the uh, yesterday, we're going to bring in, this is an opportunity to bring in actual fans of the show, audience members of the show. Tr John Haley came up with this idea of incorporating them into the show while, while debating them about their approval rating scores. And if you haven't downloaded the approval rating app, you need to do that. It's in the Apple Store. It's in the Google Store if you got one of those Android phones. Uh, we have a gentleman here, I believe, by the name of Todd Robinson. He has an absolutely ridiculous and stupid opinion. I've been told about the movie New Jack City. Oh, do we, do we have, uh, hopefully we have uh, Todd's rating because now I got to find Todd in my approval rating. But let's call up Todd. Oh, Todd, yeah. What's up, Todd, handsome guy. Uh, <laughs> looks like he's pretty smart. Uh, but based on this rating, uh, Todd, you don't know what you're talking about. Look, you need yeah. to rewatch New Jack City. Jack. Rewatch it. I don't. You don't look old enough to have seen it when it first came out. So, but Jack. if you rewatch it, New Jack City is like. What do you got it at? Like a ninety, a ninety? Yeah. You got it at a smoke yeah. show? I mean, at Blazing, Blazing Hot. Hot. Yes. It, one of the most yeah. overrated movies of all time. Uh, to Jay. defend your position. Jay, I'm looking at what you said. Jay, it says that you said iced tea. 
Nobody is going to watch New Jack City for Ice-T. Cut it out, first of all. We're there for Wesley Snipes. Wesley Snipes absolutely kills his role. I mean, am I my brother's keeper? Listen, we, I know you was looking for You was looking for a cameo. You was, just, you was mad because you didn't get cameo by Coco. You was looking for that butter. It wasn't on there. She wasn't on that show. I'm telling you. What you got to say, Jay? Well, I can say this. Ice-T's acting was so terrible in this movie and so comical, and he was so in over his head, and his relationship with, what was the white cop with the buzz haircut? He's a popular actor, uh, very popular. I think he was in Breakfast Club. I, I don't know why I can't think of the white dude. There was the other cop that was crazy. Their whole narrative around them was just silly and stupid, and, and the other actors opposite Wesley Snipes were mediocre to bad. I, 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 look, when I saw it as a young person, like yourself, when I was young and silly and didn't know what I was looking at, I enjoyed the movie and thought it was great. I just happened to rewatch it in the last year or two, and I've got it at a 67, a yeah, grease fire. And I, I've heard, I've heard nothing from you that, I'm yeah. sorry, go ahead. <laughs> I, you must have forgot about Ice T. See, he had that song "Cop Killer." You remember that? So he had to yeah. do that role. That was his apology for him doing that song. That was him to get back slid into the 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 uh what you call it the the L A whatever that that lifestyle the movie style because he had to do that because he had to apologize that. They had to make him play that role. So he did exactly what he's supposed to do. He looked just like a bum. He looked like an undercover cop being a bum, and he played it to the T. To the T. And the, and the, uh, and the movie's nice called attempt, New Jack City. There's a reason why I'm the host of this show. It's because I'm the smartest person on the show. <laughs> and uh, Hadley, I'm going to give you a strike. Right now, you're down one. Todd, Todd brought nothing to the table, Hadley. Todd, oh, I got it. I'm done I with you. you. Go, New Jack City. Go they fill out other things on the approval app. T cut Todd off. We're done with Todd. Uh, we're done with Todd. While you guys uh, line up the next person for me to slaughter, uh, let me, while you're dialing them up, let me tell you guys about Nefarious. Uh, that is the movie uh, that uh, my good friend, our good friend, our Blaze uh, co-worker, uh, Steve Dace, uh, heavily involved in. He wrote the book. Uh, Nefer I've seen the movie. Uh, I saw a premiere of it right here in these studios a couple of months ago. I can recommend it to you without hesitation. It's an excellent movie. It's an entertaining movie. Look, you guys know, I walk out of most movies. Probably half of them. I fall asleep in half of the movies that I sit through. I'm a tough movie critic. When I tell you a movie's good and worth you paying money to see, take that recommendation. This is, it's interesting for those of you that have a biblical worldview, for those of you that are tired of, of the same woke movies with the same theme all the time, this is different. It's a twist. It's got a great twist. It's going to have you on the edge of your seats. It's going to have you a little bit scared. There's this guy that's being sentenced to death, and they've sent this investigator into his prison cell or into the prison to find out if the guy's sane enough to be killed. The psychiatrist they send in there thinks he's the smartest guy in the world. The, the, the killer thinks he's the smartest guy in the world. They have this clash. I'm not going to blow the whole movie for you, but it's a supernatural thriller. It's perfect for you and your friends that love scary movies. But more than that, it's not going to violate your biblical worldview. It's you can go see it and enjoy it and feel like you're just at any other movie. It's, trem it's tremendous. It's going to start a great conversation afterwards. Nefarious opens nationwide the weekend of April 14th. Mark the date and get your tickets now at whoisnefarious.com. Dot com. That's who is nefarious dot com. All right, who, uh, I believe uh, Brian Elias is my next victim. Brian, uh, welcome. Uh oh, what? Are, Brian, oh well, God, I remember looking at this. I can't. <laughs> I can't I Look, I'm not even the biggest Kobe Bryant fan in the world. I'm known for being a Kobe Bryant critic. Okay. But Lord have mercy, 
Brian, you slaughtered Kobe Bryant on the, <laughs> on the approval. I can't believe it. You got him at yeah. a 67. You gave him a... <laughs> that, that's accurate. I, I hope your house has 24-hour security because Snoop Dogg and everybody's going to come looking for, <laughs> for you. They're going to do you like they did Gail King. My uh, God. Please justify this, Brian. Listen, man, I think we have forgot a lot of stuff, right? We need to be Americans and not be amnesians, right? People who forget. We must have forgot that Kobe, he snitched. He's a rat. Shaq, right? Well, Shaq, Shaq pays women for, you know, hush money and, and this and that. Can you imagine what Shaq, Kobe, 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 don't say that, Kobe, Kobe. Come on, man, listen. <laughs> I don't care what you say. You don't snitch on your homeboys, right? You know in, in, where, where, where I'm from, what we say, right? Snitches get stitches, right? But especially on your homeboy. Come on, y'all. Come on, man. You don't do that. You don't do that. And we forgot. We forgot. We forgot oh, about that. You got him in like a three in character, man. And listen, mm. I was right there with you. I was right there with you. But post playing career, mm. I liked Kobe Bryant. I like where he had pivoted. You know, he had his bad moment, a really bad moment in Colorado, yeah. and he did yeah. snitch on Shaq. But you yeah. can't judge a man off of one incident. You got to um, judge the whole body of work. And yeah. I mean, but, but look, if you look at his career, you look at his worth, his it factor, I gave it to him. I was a fan, right? When he came out, I was Kobe, Kobe. But when he did this, I was like, no, B, no, B, don't do this. <laughs> that sufficed uh, for me. So I had to hear his character. All right. So, uh, Hadley, I'll say this. I think Brian actually did a good job. I disagree with him. Snoop, if anybody's watching this and they get mad and they want to treat somebody like Gail King, make it Brian, not me. Uh, you know, I had, I think I got Kobe rated like an 80 on the approval rating app. And so uh, I, I think 67 is just too low. You got you to gotta be right in the middle with Kobe on, you know, 14, 13, 15 in, in character. I, I can't go all the way down to a three. And yes, what the Colorado thing from the allegations from the woman, to what he did about Shaq, I get it. But I, I, I can't go there. Uh, I think, Hadley, it's one-to-one -one right now. You, we got one good one, one okay one. Uh, before we go to our next uh, approval rating person, I want to uh, tell you all that there's still time for you to sign up uh, for Roll Call. And I want you to sign up for Roll Call. And I've had some people email me, and I want to assure people that uh, on April 14th and 15th here in Nashville, we are taking all of the necessary safety precautions, security precautions to make sure that everybody has a good time and everybody feels completely safe. We have partnered with law enforcement. We're not gonna have a problem. We are not gonna have a problem on Friday at the cookout, Saturday breakfast, Saturday at the event all day, we're not going to have a problem. We, we, we have heightened security. We understand where we're at here in Nashville. We understand where we're at here in the country. We're going to come together and we're going to put Jesus front and center and we're going to worship him, fellowship together, and we're going to give inspirational talks and discussions that tell you how to be a real man in this society. Politics isn't going to be a part of this. Uh, you know, the transgender crowd or whatever is not going to be a focus of our discussion. It, it, it is. We're going to give people practical advice on how to deal with these issues in the workplace and all that and, and, and try to inspire you so that you know how to lead your family and disciple your kids so they don't fall into these dysphoria traps that the left is laying. But we're not trying to hurt anybody. We're not trying to denigrate anybody. We're going to be trying to uplift Jesus and, and all these other idols will have no place 
You know, we're not we're not here to worship LeBron James or or Donald Trump or anybody. We're going to celebrate Jesus. We're going to eat some good food. We're going to have some great singing. Bryson Gray, Tamar Conrad, you'll get to hear people tomorrow sing Freedom, the song that plays at the end of most shows live. Those of you that love the Harmony Show, you'll get to hear that live. Bryson Gray is going to come and rap and get us all hyped up. It's going to be awesome and safe. All right, uh, Hadley, let me go back uh, to your next guest. And this one's going to be light work, real light work for me. Uh, he calls himself Pappy Gang. He's got the worst rating I've ever seen on the app so far. Uh, he's got Tupac Shakur at a perfect score of 100 with a character rating of 25 perfection. Pa Pappy. Right. Tupac went to prison for rape, bruh. St t help me out. <laughs> what what is he, what's he got to do to lower his character? Where you got OJ rated? 101? Hold on, hold on. What? Help. <laughs> hold on, hold on. Hold on, Jason. You got to check this out. So if anybody should know anything, it's you. And you should know that's fake news. We're talking about the same Pac that's for the people, the same Pac that love the kids, the same Pac that believe in God. Now this is the same Pac that's raping women? I believe not. I believe not. We're talking about we talking about Tupac, the one that's fearless. This fearless with Jason Whitlock, right? Am I on the right show? Because I think you got the wrong <laughs> rating. I think you got the wrong rating. We're talking about Pac. Come on. <laughs> Tupac's a gangster rapper. Tupac's on video beating up a man in the lobby at the MGM, but oh, taking some tail is a bridge too far for Tupac. That's allegedly. <laughs> okay, That's let's, remo let's remove the rape charges that he went to prison for two and a half years for. He then partners up with Suge Knight, a known gang kingpin a known killer. He beats up a man, another gang member, in the lobby of the MGM. I mean, what I see is he teamed up. A 25 up. perfect character? Yes, 25 character. Yes, Pac was, literally, Pac was perfect. Pac was literally almost perfect, man. You gotta give Pac credit. You mean, you're, you're, you're discrediting who he is because he went to the biggest label so he could have the biggest voice to reach the people? That's what I see. That's what I see. That's what I see. I don't know what you see, Jason. Pop, how, how old are you, Poppy? I'm 27. So, you weren't even alive <laughs> during Tupac's heyday, correct? Correct. Well, I was born when he was dying. <laughs> and <laughs> have you ever listened to Hit 'Em Up? Yes, I have. The greatest <laughs> have you ever listened to Hit 'Em Up? Yeah. Tell me how you do Hit 'Em Up and have a perfect character. You talk, he got shot at. I would make Hit 'Em Up if somebody shot at me too. I think you would too, wouldn't you? No, I wouldn't. You wouldn't. I get wouldn't. on my knees and pray to God. Thank <laughs> you for saving me. And please don't let me ever do anything to get put in this position again. I can respect that. I can respect that. <laughs> so, Poppy, so even uh, still, yeah, you still got a low. You still got uh, what did you have pocket for his character? I think. Uh, well, do we have do we have my two pock score? I can look it up. I guess. Oh, we don't have my two. I can look it up here in the app. You got Poppy. I'm gonna let you go. I, I will tell you uh, my score as we wave goodbye to you. I can't, that's still the worst score. It makes me s suspect of any of your other scores in the app. My God, people think all kinds of crazy things. And Tupac, as, oh, I got him at a 60. No, I got, I got hit him up at a 60. I got Tupac at a 65. Yeah, Tupac at a 65. I give his career a 24. He, he's, you know, and would have, you know, in my view, there's an argument he's the greatest rapper of all time. Uh, you know, I couldn't go perfect just because he's a gangster rapper. Character, I gave him a one. He did make Dear Mama. Uh, authenticity, I only gave him a 15 in authenticity because, again, Tupac, I really don't, he adopted that gangster stuff. That ain't really who he is. 
Uh, brand, he's got a strong brand. He got 27 year old kids out here thinking Tupac's 100, <laughs> thinking there's no way that a guy that made all that nasty, vile, uh, de <laughs> degenerate music, oh, there's no way. There's no way he sexually assaulted him. <sighs> this is what I love about this app, though. It does start conversations. And it does, like, an old man like me can talk to someone half my age and have a discussion, a conversation with him, and try to talk some sense into these young people. Tupac, 100. Uh, and I think we're ready for our, our final approval rating guest. Hadley said he saved the best for last, uh, although I'm not so sure. I, I don't, uh, I believe the young lady's name is Lauren, and she has uh, rated me or dropped my rating quite a bit, my personal, the Jason Whitlock rating. I believe Lauren gave me a two in character, and uh, Lauren, I would like an explanation why. Listen, Jason, we love your show and we tune in to listen to you about your faith, your uh, take on things. And we especially love Shamika because she actually represents real women of the world. Now, your character. If we were just here for your uh, eye candy and your intelligence, you have that cover. We've got Royce White segments. We've got Delano. Heck, even throw in Coach JB and sprinkle in some of that uh, Steve Kim. And come on, bring back Larry Johnson with a shirt off. If we're just talking about eye candy. <laughs> but the arrogance about, you know, the hair color and the confidence that us women just tune in for your looks. We had we had to drop the character. To a two? Hey. And you can't. And so are, are you actually suggesting that Royce White and Larry Johnson and Delano look better than me? Or is that what you're suggesting? Hey, I said what I said and I meant it. So we tune in to your show because we love your take on your you know, politics and sports. We get all of that. But the eye candy, leave it to the other guys. Uh, bye, Lauren. <laughs> bye. Uh, Hadley, I'm blaming you for that. That was a setup. There's no way that's an authentic member of our audience. I want to Neil or Connie or someone that I see in the chat on a regular basis on this show next week. I don't want any of these ringers or I'm sure that's some kind of friend of Royce's or a friend of, of who did she say? Royce and she referenced Steve Kim. But I, I'm not I'm not buying that that that's a real member of our audience. Probably never seen the show. Y'all probably gave her talking points. Uh, anyway, uh, you know what? Steve Kim's next. Let's go. All right, welcome back. I, I have to admit that last segment uh, kind of bruised my ego. Uh, no, it didn't. Steve Kim. <laughs> Steve Kim. I found one, we Hadley found the one person in America who thinks you're better looking than me. Uh, I, I don't know what he paid her. I don't know what bribe was offered, uh, but I was just insulted uh, on this show. And so now I got to go to you. And uh, I want to talk about Angel Reese, Steve. Angel Reese and LSU, they have accepted uh, their invitation to the White House ceremony. I know you can't wait for this story to be over, but they just keep extending the life of the story, and I'm starting to be fatigued by it. I don't care if LSU goes to the White House. I, do, I always knew they were gonna accept the invitation. There's not some 19, 20-year-old girl that no one had ever heard of 
Angel Reese that now is a shot caller about what LSU is going to do and who's going to go to the White House or whatever. Uh, anyway, your thoughts on Angel Reese, she's and the LSU team agreeing to go uh, to the White House. Well, I, I don't understand this. Um, LSU was always going to get the invite. It was one individual that says, I'm not going to take it. I actually think she should have been given the option not to go. If you feel that strongly about it. Now, I want to make this clear. Jill Biden's invite to both teams was really dumb and stupid. Um, Angel Reese's answer was dumber and stupider. But at the, but when it's all said and done, she still has a right to say, I, I'm going to sit out. But this is another reason why I, I don't take athletes as activists seriously. They have no guts. They actually don't mean a thing that they say. The fact that she capitulated and just accepted the invite says everything I need to know about whatever she says in the future. Now, this is going to surprise you. If she would have stuck by a word and said, no, 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 no. I'm waiting for uh, Barry and Michelle. Um, I'm going over to the vineyards right now. I'm going to wait for them. And would have you know what? I would have respected that. But this is another example of why when athletes take any type of stance, don't believe them. Don't take them seriously. Pet them on the head. Roll out the balls. Let them play. But do not take them seriously ever. I agree with everything you just said 100%. I'll just add in, she's so addicted to attention, of course she's going to go to the White House. There will be <laughs> cameras and microphones there. Like, like she really, she, she never had any intention. She's just in love with the attention. She's a young girl. They love attention. She's six foot three or whatever. And so she probably hasn't gotten the kind of attention she's always wanted. And she's getting it now. People are hanging on her every word. People are treating her like she's a big deal. Uh, she's by you Barbie and, you know, is going to parlay this into being the hot six foot three basketball player. And again, it's, that's going to be a stretch, but it, you know, anytime you can turn Lizzo into a sex symbol, uh, you can probably do the same. You can certainly do the same with a basketball player. But she's just, for lack of a better description, and I hate to be uh, politically incorrect, but she's just an attention whore. And there's going to be attention at the White House, so of course she's going. I mean, I think that's to be expected. Look, but when you win the MVP or whatever that tournament award is and look she's she's a nice looking young lady okay and so she she's she's now the queen of college basketball outside of iowa right so now she's going to get this attention and i don't know if it's going to be 15 minutes of fame or not but uh you know as far as i'm concerned now it's going to be 15 minutes she's not a very skilled player steve she's just tall no way, you should have watched the on. tournament i'm gonna move you oh no wait a minute what? she was Okay, now I'm going to become female basketball Dick Vitale. This is going to sicken me here. But wasn't she the second-ranked player out of high school? I read on one of those graphics. She played pretty well. She was not as good as that girl at Iowa. I She's guess. tall! Yeah, uh, Jason, newsflash. Most Division I basketball players, men and women, get this, are tall. That's why there's not a lot of Asians. <laughs> We're in the chemistry lab. We're 5'7". <laughs> We can't run or jump. <laughs> Some of us can shoot, but we have no athleticism. So we know our lot in life. But to say that she can't play Jason, come on. I said she's not little. skilled. That's the same thing. She is. She ain't skilled. Cheryl Miller. She's, no, not she's not Cheryl Miller. She's not Lisa Leslie. She's not Cheryl Swoops. Look at me with my basketball female. Look, but okay. But for this particular year, she's the probably the most valuable player on the best team. And she did that little thing. So that means something, something. And by the way, she needs to be thanking God that right. Iowa beat South Carolina because okay. if they hadn't, no the way, one would know who Angel Reese is. And by the way, your agitation, blame you because we should have ended all of this talk on Wednesday, but here we are on Friday talking about Angel Reese. <laughs> I don't set the, I don't set the format you do Whitlock, but anyway, Let's go. Keep, keep it moving. Uh, let's stay in the female <laughs> sports athletic lane, and this is a bit oh, more geez. serious. Really? Again? Do, do we have the video of Raleigh Gaines and D Pozo? Yeah. Uh,
put up some video of transgender activists going after Riley Gaines, University of Kentucky swimmer, who's been pretty outspoken. She doesn't want to compete against men uh, pretending to be a boy, I mean, pretending to be girls. She's been going around the country speaking. And I'm not, I can't recall off the top of my head what school she was speaking at last night, but they had to put her, bunker her in, barricade her in. Take a look at this video. So, I mean, she had to be escorted off into safety. And, uh, I mean, she's taking real risk here uh, with her position standing up against Leah Thomas and competing against men in women's sports. I'm fascinated by, by this whole thing, the protesters. Why are they so passionate about it when they know it is general biology? But again... I'm beginning to think we need to let back water hoses and billy clubs. I mean, good grief. I, I long for the good old days of public control. And, and that is an angry mob. And I want to give Riley, young Riley, there are a lot of credit because I think it takes incredible amount of fortitude and guts. But this question has to be asked of those who wag the finger on a daily basis, on a regular basis, the Jamel Hills, the uh, Joy Taylors of the world now. Um, that tell us that women's sports are important, that we need to cover them, that we need to spotlight them, and, and that we need to go out there and, and give equal treatment and that it's important. They themselves do not say a word about this. And it's very simple. You know why. It's not in their script. They're not allowed to. It's not part of the approved messaging. But you cannot tell me on one hand that women's sports needs to be covered, that it's important, that it's every bit as good when you allow this type of behavior to take place. I'm looking at some of the footage, Jason, of combat sports, specifically the MMA, where there are transgender males who are literally crushing people's skulls. Now, first of all, it's already dangerous. Anytime you get hit by anybody, it never tickles, trust me. But when you are now going into bone density, lean muscle mass, and overall strength, and the images that you're seeing of people just getting laid out, and you know it's not right, Uh, And I hope to God boxing never crosses. They already have one transgender boxer. I really hope to God I'm not in a position where you have to be ringside and watch this type of really unbalanced competition. You make an excellent point, and I'm I'm glad you went there because that was part of my thought process that I had forgotten. I've seen the video of this. I think this person, this man pretending to be a woman, has crushed two skulls, I think, no. in MMA competition. It, it, it's this is ridiculous, and and that we're tolerating this, and and to see this young lady, the Riley Gaines, out here on the front lines, and facing the kind of animus, a woman speaking out to to protect other women from unfair competition, and you don't see other women, Sarah Spain, Mina Kimes, Jamel Hill, all the rest running to support this woman. It's crazy and doesn't, you don't see Stephen A. Smith. Stephen A. Smith will jump on a grenade, will literally jump on a grenade so that a little black girl at Duke doesn't hear some harmful words at a volleyball match. But Riley Gaines can face this type of harassment and threats because she wants to protect women's sports? Th- that's, it, it, it's a joke and it, points to the hypocrisy, the stupidity, and the cowardice of, of all of us, and particularly them, and the hypocrisy of all of them. Uh, on a lighter note, you got any advice for Cam Newton? Cam Newton 
puts out a list or goes on camera talking about here's the quarterbacks I'm willing to back up. You're willing. Okay. What is this guy thinking? This is what, what okay. is he thinking? He's out of the league the entire year, and and there's only a certain group of teams that he will grant the privilege of of being a backup quarterback to. And he's wondering why he's not in the league. He still exists in a state of delusion. He still thinks he's the same guy that came out of uh, Auburn as the number one pick. You ain't got it like that, Cam. You can't dictate anything at this point. You got to be willing to The guy should damn near be willing to play in the XFL, let alone, hey, here's a, a list of teams I'll play for and quarterbacks I'll back up. That's a joke. Well, Your reaction? Unless, yeah, I mean, Jason, unless that list had 32 teams, all 32 teams, it just comes off as entitled. And there's only one thing that he really needs right now, and that's a hot tub time machine to 2015. Because since that MVP year, it's been a slow, steady, and then a precipitous decline. And the feeling that I have is that once that experiment or that run, the second run in Carolina came to an end where he just really was not effective at all, and it looks like he had diminished offensive capabilities or athletic capabilities, you got the sense, geez, like Cam, it's over. You had a really nice career. You made a lot of money. But the lack of self-awareness, as if to say, I've got suitors and I've got choices, you know, again, I'm going to draw back to a Kevin Samuels analogy. It's like that lady that put on 30 pounds after four kids after the divorce. You know, lady, when you're at Applebee's at 11 o'clock at night, um, people don't – you don't really get to choose. Guys get to choose you on last call. Give me a break. So that's what it is. That's what Cam Newton is right now. And I I feel bad for him because I don't think anyone in his inner circle has said, Cam, this is where you stand right now. Really. Because I don't... Take inner circle out of it, though, Steve. I'm concerned about the outer circle, the media. The media is the one that feeds the delusion, and and, and they do it to all the black quarterbacks. You're untouchable. You're you're the greatest thing ever. They're afraid to write it because they don't want some random guy on Twitter saying you're racist. Or (laughs) this is the one that you keep that same energy. And you are. What about? (laughs) What about? What about? What about Brett Farr? (laughs) But it it brings to mind that old line from Thomas Sowell. Uh, When you've had special treatment your whole life, equal treatment seems oppressive. And right now. Yeah. That's good. Yeah, Thomas. Thomas was good. Mr. Soul, God bless him. We we're lucky to have him still. But that's, to me, look, Cam was an exquisite athlete. I will always say it. His performance as a college player in 2010 from an individual standpoint as good as I've ever seen. 2015 was a magical year. He's had a good career. But the last five years, there's nothing in his resume that says, yeah, that's a steady veteran backup that I want mentoring a young QB. He doesn't fit that profile. Yeah, I'm going to mentor someone into the same kind of delusional state that I have that has cost me my NFL career. I love the Thomas Soul quote you just gave because that does just explain a lot. When you yeah. exist in a bubble of being your butt kissed and then all of a sudden you get treated like everyone else, it does oh, feel like oppression. It's a harsh it's, reality. That's a wonderful, yeah. yeah. That's a wonderful, wonderful quote. All right, uh, speaking kind of along the same topic, although a different twist on it, Steve Kime, uh, <clears throat> the former uh, general manager of the Arizona Cardinals, had some very honest things to say about Kyler oh. Murray. That And when these things came out, when they tried to put a clause in Kyler Murray's contract about study, film study, and homework and things like that, people, oh, that's racist. And it was actually just the Arizona Cardinals trying to help this guy out because he's deficient in that area. I'm shocked that Steve Kime, not Kim, 
would make these statements on the record, but he did. Let's take a listen or watch. You know, I think he need, he still needs to grow, and yeah. and it's not a. Again, it's not slanted towards his his character. He he is not a bad guy. He's yeah. a really good kid. Has a good smile and has a nice way about him. Um, I think it's like anything. Guys have to continue to learn what it's going to take to be great. You know, does does he know what Peyton Manning and Tom Brady know knows what it takes to be great? No. Um, does he work? He does work. Um, I think it's just that side of the uh, the game. The 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 film study, the attention to detail part that he can continue to improve upon. And I think he will. Hmm. Hmm. They tried <laughs> to put a clause in his contract to force uh, him. Some people need that type motivation. They got called racist. And, and I, I got, I, how shocked are you that he would say this on the record? Cause he'll, he's likely going to get Ryan Clark and, they may even let Kendrick Perkins talk about this and, you know, <laughs> call him all kinds of yeah, <laughs> racist never, names. I'm just. Yeah, yeah. Never mind you want a man dominating different sports, but this here is fair game, right? Look, Steve Kim <laughs> has got to give Steve Kime some credit. But again, he's no longer employed. What does he have to lose? And, and, and I really believe that not only was Kyler Murray a bit of a coach killer, he was a GM killer because there were a lot of casualties due to his play. But that, that's the thing. Look, we said this about a year ago, that you have to put that clause in to begin with and you are investing hundreds of millions of dollars into your franchise quarterback. Jason, if that's the issue, that should not be your franchise quarterback. And here's what I thought was interesting. Um, the Hard Knock series, which I am just a fanatic of. I've watched every version of it on every network, in season, out season, all the seasons on HBO, the one season they were on NFL Network with the Jaguars. So this past year, they did something on the Cardinals, right? And they did it from like week eight on. And that's when he got injured. And again, I know it's just reality TV. And but so this is just a very limited viewpoint. I noticed immediately, and I said this to Coach Brown, I got the sense that the coaching staff, starting with Kingsbury and some of the players, they liked having Colt McCoy back there. Not from a talent perspective, because he's not better. But I'm talking in terms of the way he prepared, the way he dealt with teammates, the way he got everyone on the same page, how conscientious he was, because Colt looks like he's going to be a future coach. It just seemed to me that when Kyler was gone, they missed his talent and his production for whatever it was. They didn't miss anything else. I thought that was very evident in watching those episodes on HBO. So none of this surprises me. Steve, have a great weekend. Great job as always. Uh, we'll talk to you next week. <clears throat> All right, you can email me and us, fearlessblazeshow at gmail.com. I want your emails. Give me your feedback on these people that are trying to disagree with me. Perhaps you want to be one. Download the approval rating app. Email me. Maybe you got some take you want to disagree with me on. We want to make the audience a part of the show. Uh, we appreciate you. You're fearless soldiers. Uh, I'll even put up with some of your silliness, like someone rating Tupac a perfect hundred and <laughs> saying his character is flawless. Uh, and so, uh, based on John Hadley's advice, when we come back, it's going to turn a bit more serious. I'm going to unpack my fire starter, and then we're going to talk to uh, Robbie Starbuck next. Welcome back. All right, it's time to start the fire. I think Hadley's good with me starting it here. So we'll get to it. A little bit more serious ending to the show than some of the previous uh, discussions we've been having. Uh, the political theater transpiring inside the Tennessee House of Representatives is the reality show version of the HBO documentary series Paradise Lost. In three separate documentaries starting in 1996, HBO desperately tried to exonerate three Satan-worshipping West Memphis, Arkansas teenagers of the murder of three eight-year-old boys. The docs turned convicted murderers, Damian Eccles, Jason Baldwin, and Jesse Miss Kelly into cult heroes nicknamed the Memphis Three. Hollywood celebrities fell in love with Eccles, the occult ringleader of the group, 
Pearl Jam lead singer Eddie Vedder and actor Johnny Depp enthusiastically fought for the release of the Memphis Three. The public pressure worked. After 18 years behind bars, the Arkansas courts negotiated an Alford plea in 2011 with Eccles, Baldwin, and Miss Kelly, releasing them from prison with time served. Eccles had been on death row. Years ago, <clears throat> I was completely fascinated by the case. I watched all three HBO documentaries. Each doc recklessly pointed a finger at a new suspect. I read, a I read a handful of books about the case. At one point, I even tracked down and talked with a lawyer involved in the trial work. At times, I was convinced the police had rushed to judgment. Some of the DNA evidence kind of swayed me for a while. But eventually, I realized Eccles was a devil worshiper who led his two friends to participate in a ritual killing of three children. I thought of Paradise Lost yesterday when three Tennessee politicians stepped on the dead bodies of three nine-year-olds to elevate themselves as political cult heroes. Justin Jones, Justin Pearson, and Gloria Johnson, three members of the Tennessee House, have made themselves the face and victims of the Nashville Covenant School Massacre. Late last week, Jones, Pearson, and Johnson organized an anti-Second Amendment protest at the House that disrupted work on the floor. Using megaphones, the, the Tennessee three flanked, or two of them, Jones and Pearson, flanked by Johnson, took over the House well while protesters shouted from the gallery and outside the House doors. It was a miniature, harmless version of January 6. In these hyper-partisan times, no one can be all that surprised that the provocative actions of three Democrats sparked a strong rebuke by Republicans. Yesterday, Republicans voted to expel Jones and Pearson and came up one vote short of expelling Johnson. It's all symbolic. Jones and Pearson are expected to be reinstated within a few days. But that hasn't stopped corporate media and political actors from framing Thursday's explosion as the latest example of Mississippi burning. Jones and Pearson are black, Johnson is white. Listen to what Justin Jones had to say. The world is watching Tennessee. The world is watching Tennessee. Because what is happening here today is a farce of democracy. What is happening here today is a situation in which the jury has already publicly announced the verdict. Just yesterday, the House Speaker took to national news to condemn us and call for our expulsion before any evidence was presented, before any trial happened. And so what we see today is just a spectacle. What we see today is a lynch mob assembled to not lynch me, but our democratic process. But it will not stand because no lie can live forever. Jones later told MSNBC's Joy Reid that he was voted out for being an uppity Negro. When Pearson spoke from the House floor, he changed his voice tone and cadence to mimic Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Take a listen for yourself. Yes, I tell you, it was a sad day on Saturday. All hope seemed to be lost. Representatives were thrown out of the state house. Democracy seemed to be at its end. Seemed like the NRA and gun lobbyists might win. But oh, that was good news for us. I don't know how long this Saturday in the state of Tennessee might last. But oh, we have good news, folks. We've got good news that Sunday always comes. Resurrection is a promise. And it is a prophecy. It's a prophecy that came out of the cotton fields. It's a prophecy that came out of the lynching tree. It's a prophecy that still lives in each and every one of us in order to make the state of Tennessee the place that it ought to be. And so I've still got hope because I know we are still here and we will never quit. <laughs>
this is this is like a joke, man. From the Afro to the boys, we goes overcomes. I, I mean, it's it's just all cosplay intended to distract from focusing on what caused a transgender woman to snap and kill Christians. Nashville police, they have not released Audrey Hale's manifesto. Yesterday in Colorado, law enforcement arrested a transgender person who was allegedly plotting a mass shooting at schools and churches. The suspect had written a manifesto expressing communist beliefs. There might be a pattern here but we're not gonna find out. Corporate and social media and educators seem to be promoting gender dysphoria among young people and radicalizing those young people to view Christians and Christianity as their mortal enemy. The message seems clear. If Christians would just accept a wide spectrum of genders, America would be a better, more inclusive place. So-called transgender people are justified in turning violent towards Christians but we're not gonna have that discussion. Instead, they want us to talk about racism and the need to throw out the Second Amendment. The people pulling the strings realize they don't want to have the transgender discussion in public. Matt Walsh's documentary, What is a Woman? exposed the dangers of defending transgenderism in public. Leftists look insane. The way to stay on the offensive is to mask the real agenda with race. Bring in the useful idiots, the so-called Tennessee Three. Justin Jones and Justin Pearson are the stars of this version of Paradise Lost. They're Damian Eccles, the devil-worshipping media darling who overshadowed Steve Branch, Michael Moore, and Christopher Byers, the three eight-year-olds killed in West Memphis, Arkansas 30 years ago. Does anybody know the names of the three nine-year-olds killed at Covenant School? Evelyn Dickhouse, William Kinney, Hallie Scruggs? Is it a coincidence that leftists always seem to use dead children to advance their agenda? The Memphis Three were used to shake confidence in our criminal justice system. Let me repeat what I said earlier. HBO paid three different, paid for three different documentaries trying to prove the West Memphis Three were innocent. Each doc irresponsibly accused someone else of the crime. 30 years later, we now have a group of citizens who believe it's justifiable to turn violent anytime the courts render a criminal verdict the mainstream media say is wrong and racist. School shootings are being used to undermine the Second Amendment. We can protect kids in schools without disarming the American public. If we spent the money we funneled to Ukraine on school safety, we could eliminate mass shootings at schools. Children are being sacrificed to empower the government and undermine the rights of citizens. We've lost the American paradise. That's my fire starter. I want to bring in Robbie Starbuck, who was with us last week uh, when the events, when the baby miniature insurrection went on at the Tennessee House. Robbie, in real time, as those events were playing out, brought up the possibility that these guys would be expelled. They've been expelled, as he predicted they might be. And Robbie, I, I just want to bring you in to get some perspective on what is the significance of them being expelled when we kind of know they're going to get their positions back in a few days or a week or two. Is it still significant that they were expelled? Well, it's very significant, Jason. And by the way, that was a brilliant monologue. I just I want to I wanted to applaud. And I was laughing when you were laughing, too. Um, you were just fantastic there. But I can make another prediction real quick. Um, you know, yes, we expect them to be renamed back to their seats. However, they would need to be reseated in order to become reps again. I would predict 
they will not be seated and that they will be forced to go to the next election season and win an election if they want to be seated because they've been expelled. And I think in spirit, there are not going to be the numbers necessary to get them seated. And so that's my my next prediction, I think will play out very well, similarly to the first one. Um, however, the significance. Hold on, Robbie, hold for one second. Uh, hold for one second. Just because I'm somewhat of a political novice, I am a political novice. Unpack for me how they can be reinstated, but not reseated. How, how, how does that how can that happen? So let's use Justin Jones as an example, OK, um, who, by the way, <laughs> Somehow we tricked the Democrats into making him the face of the Tennessee Democratic Party, a far left Marxist who's been arrested three times, including for assault. Let's use him as an example, okay? So he is going to be renamed by Metro Council, okay? Metro Council has the ability to name who's going to take over for him. They plan to name him by all accounts. That's everything that we've heard is they're going to rename him. And so when they do, the House has to seat anybody who comes in through a special election or any sort of special purpose or through a normal election. You have to be seated. You get sworn in. So he has to re-undergo the same process he did when he was first elected. However, they have a choice to not seat somebody. It's something that actually has to be agreed upon. So they, I don't think, will seat him, and he'll have to go fight in a new election. Mm, all right. Now, go ahead with the, the additional points you wanted to make. Yeah, what I was going to say is the significance of this all happening is that, you know, for far too long, the Democrats have gotten comfortable with the idea that nobody's ever going to hold them accountable. And this is why this moment means a lot to conservatives that we're actually holding some of these far left extremists accountable because we're making them play by their own rules. And there's been some people who go, well, you know, there could be this negative outcome, that negative outcome. The truth is that attitude is what got us here to this point where we have far left extremists who feel comfortable taking taking over a legislature with bullhorns and whipping up their activists to act like lunatics inside of the state house when we're trying to get work done to protect kids. And instead, and you know, this is the thing I've seen no media cover. Did you know right before they pulled their stunt where they pulled their bullhorns out and acted like lunatics, all three of them voted against a bill that would provide armed security to every school? OK, including private schools, the other Democrats in their party voted for the bill alongside the rest of the Republicans. There were maybe two or three other Democrats alongside them who did not vote for it. So these three performatively pretended they cared to protect kids. Yet right before their stunt, they voted against that bill. OK, so these are people, like you said, doing this over the dead bodies of children to go and get themselves elevated onto a platform and to make it about themselves. So I think there's enough people in the state house who are disgusted by it to ensure that they don't get seated again. Did the Republicans make a tactical error not expelling Gloria Johnson, making sure they had the votes to get her out and giving the other side the, the option, the tactic, the strategy of saying, oh, this is racist. They kicked the two black guys out. They didn't kick the white woman out. Is, is that a, did they make a mistake or do you understand why some people were a tiny bit uncomfortable with expelling Gloria Johnson? Well, they did make a tactical mistake because they should have expelled all three, which is what I had been advocating for. Um, Gloria was a part of it, just like them. I do understand some reps saw some nuance between her actions and theirs because she wasn't the one on the bullhorn. She wasn't, you know, smacking the podium and she wasn't whipping people up quite the same way. But she was up there. She was part of disrupting it. She had done it in concert with those two gentlemen um, who I struggle to call gentlemen, but, you know, out of some sort of weird sense of normalcy, I will. Um, you know, I think she should have been expelled. However, there's that little bit of nuance there that resulted in her not being expelled. I think that we've got to be smart about this stuff, though. It was just entirely predictable she was going to make it about racism. And she turned right around and said, the only reason I'm not is because I'm white. It, it just, you know, sometimes we step on our own tail. And this is a case of that where some people got a little too smart. And I think that we've got to be actually smart and think about how the left is going to use these things. And she, by all accounts, broke the rules. That's what we're expelling them for. It's not did they break the rules by this much or, or this much? It's not by levels. She broke the rules. They should have expelled her. What do you think of the political future for Justin Pearson and Justin Jones? They certainly are national stars on CNN and MSNBC. 
what's their future here in the state of Tennessee in, in, your, in your view? Justin Pearson, I actually think, could stick around for a long time because he's in Memphis and Steve Cohen can only hold that congressional seat for so long. So I could see Justin Pearson. It's our one Democrat seat in the state. I could see Pearson taking that seat over at some point. Um, and Pearson is, by all accounts, a little more reasonable than Justin Jones um, in terms of what I've heard from legislators. He, he's He's been a little more reasonable in the past. However, I think that his antics this week have probably gotten rid of a lot of uh, sort of goodwill that maybe he had built up over time. And I think in terms of radicalism, his ideas are just as radical as Justin Jones. He maybe just hasn't been as in their face as Justin Jones has been. Because what people have to understand is Justin, before he was elected, was a full bore activist and organizer who was constantly following people at the Capitol. He followed me for an hour once, just hounding me, asking questions and acting like a lunatic. And when I say the line of questioning was just extremely bizarre, I mean extremely bizarre. And that's kind of what his MO has been for a long time. So Justin Jones, I think, is more likely to go to some sort of national org as a spokesman to rile people up or something like that and be a national organizer or something along those lines. But in terms of Tennessee politics, he doesn't have a clear seat to run for on a national level. And in terms of national politics for Tennessee, you're not going to see a far left socialist Democrat elected to a statewide seat or anything like that. It would have to be for some sort of really, uh, you know, dark blue congressional seat. And the only one we have is down in Memphis. And Justin is Jones is here in Nashville. So I don't think he has much of a future future in Tennessee politics outside of the state house. I think he could get reelected next time we go around here and maybe he sticks around at the state house. However, I think he has larger aspirations and may make significantly more money going to a national org as an organizer or a spokesperson of some sort. So I could see him doing that, but um, that's that's kind of what I see for those two guys. What do you think of my contention that much of this is a distraction from talking about the real issues? What happened to those three kids? What happened to those three adults at Covenant School? What were the motivations of the shooter? Is there some sort of radicalizing of transgender people that we're doing here in America that is, is just, when I look, I don't know if you, have you seen the video of the Riley Gaines, the swimmer from yes. the University of Kentucky just trying to speak at a school and she had to get barricaded in? And it's like, we've justified a level of violence from the transgender crowd and the LGBT crowd that, uh, we, we need to be having that discussion rather than the president, Biden and others standing up talking about Oath Keepers and Proud Boys and, and, and January 6th people. It seems like the LGBT and Black Lives Matter, this, this activist class has been told you got the green light to be as disrespectful and as unlawful as you want to be. And, and so I see part of what j the two Justins and the Tennessee Three are doing, they're distracting us away from a conversation we should be having about the people that are really domestic terrorists here in America. I like that you use the term green light because colloquially, I think you know that that's used by gangs and the Democratic Party of today is operating like a gang and they have given the green light to these far left activists and the LGBT mafia that's out there. And, and that's that's really all you can call them because you see what's going on. Riley Gaines was just essentially kidnapped in San Francisco at a university. They were demanding money to allow her safe passage out. There's no other way to describe that but some form of kidnapping. It is a crime what they did. OK, and she was hit by a man. Man dressed up as a woman doesn't make him less of a man in terms of the law, okay? He is biologically a male. It makes him less of a man maybe, you know, in some spiritual sense, but not in the physical sense. That he could still pack a punch. He hit her twice, okay? What we're seeing is criminal. It's domestic terrorism. You see what happened in Colorado, and you definitely see how they're trying to change the subject here in Tennessee away from the trans mass killer. But we see a pattern of behavior, and it's escalating all over the country. This is only going to get worse. I don't know if you saw this, but President Biden in the White House, they actually put a statement out where they said that they opposed all of these bills that protect children by not giving them sex changes before they're 18, and said not only do they oppose these, but that trans people will fight back against that. They use that term, fight back against this, okay? 
a week after a trans mass murderer shot up a Christian school and killed three little kids and three adults, and just within days of a trans potential mass killer being arrested who was plotting a mass shooting at Christian churches and schools, okay? They haven't said a word about Christians since the shooting. President Biden did not make one tweet about Christians, nothing, but he has tweeted a whole lot about trans people since that shooting. And in every single one of those tweets, it's been about how they're really the victims and these evil Republicans are the real villains here. And I'm tired of it, I'm sick of it. And the truth is the silent majority is what got us here. People need to wake up. We cannot be a silent majority. We have got to speak up in unison and we've got to stand up against this transgender ideology because it means business and it means they want to destroy the foundations of our country. So people have got to speak up. I hate asking a question like this because I have no idea if you have any insight into this, but I'm just checking my instincts and wondering if other people are seeing or suspecting or feeling the same thing as me. But I have for solid three or four years, and certainly since 2020 and the, the summer of St. George Floyd, have felt like a lot of the Antifa, and I'm sorry for asking you a question, I have no idea if you have given this a second thought, a lot of Antifa, I believe, is the transgender crowd. That, that when I see those activists in Portland and Seattle and other places, when I see Antifa a lot of places, I, I think it's gender confused. Not all, but there's a certain violent percentage of them, I think are people with gender or sexuality issues that have made them angry and really easy to radicalize. And, and that's why I just like, we, the way the government and our investigative agencies that are supposed to be keeping us secure, the way they've just had a hands-off policy with Antifa is I think how we got here. They can be violent, no consequences. Shaman can go into the uh, Capitol wearing the, the wrong helmet and he gets thrown underneath the prison they can maim people, harm people, shoot up, take over areas of Seattle and Portland, and, and it's all forgiven and it's all like just, well, we get why you're angry. I, I, I think there's a symmetry or a synergy between the trans community and Antifa. Yeah, you know, I would say your theory lines up pretty closely to mine. So this is gonna sound like a weird question I'm throwing back at you, but it's gonna make sense in a minute. Have you ever seen in the Batman comics or the movies, Arkham Asylum? No. Okay, so not Arkham Asylum only, uh, is the asylum that the Joker uses as a recruiting place. He releases all the crazy people from Arkham Asylum, and those are his henchmen. I've said for a long time, they are recruiting the mentally ill. That's what Antifa is doing. All you need to do is go to Andy No's account, okay? Andy No posts the photos, okay, of these people. Asked. That's where I get it. That's where my theory comes from. Exactly. And you can see very clearly the uniform thing you're going to find, these are mentally ill people. They are not well. They are not well at all. They're very gender confused. You can see in many of them, it's men trying to be women, women trying to be men. There's a lot of confusion going on there. But you can see also in their eyes. I always say the eyes are window into the soul, and you can see it with some of the Democrat politicians where their eyes pop out of their head. You, you can see this certain sense of lunacy, and you can see it in all these photos. And so that's been my long-running uh, you know, sort of idea around Antifa is this is a group of people recruiting mentally ill people. And that's what we're going to continue to see as long as the Democrats don't do anything about it. And unfortunately, we've reached the point where it is escalated to murder. And I think that that's going to continue until we see very real consequences for it. And th this is the truth about crime. You know, I watched this sheriff down in Florida today talk about consequences. If you don't have real consequences, people are not afraid of you, okay? And it's, it's been that way forever. That's all of human history. It's not a recent thing. And if we don't have real consequences for a community of people that is targeting Christians, targeting conservatives, they will escalate. And so it's time for consequences. I want to follow up on your point because you made me think about something that where, where this really came home to me 
and it's connected to the transgender and, and all the uh, just and, and I don't care if I sound QAnon, but this whole sexual perversion thing that, that seems to be going on and there seems to be an alliance among all these people with all these different sexual issues or gender issues. But the guy Cal Rittenhouse shot, the pedophile, and I, he, I can't remember if he killed him or whatever, but two-time convicted of pedophilia. And, and I'm just like, so he gets out of prison and the first thing he wants to do is go to a, a Black Lives Matter rally in Kenosha, Wisconsin. I, I go, this just doesn't make sense. Why, why are all these ex-cons with all this sexual baggage and history, and, and I'm just like, they have studied, they have a profile of the perfect people to radicalize. They, they're not qualified. I can remember I was living out in LA, Robbie, and you're the perfect person, you're from LA. I, I'm walking in Century City, I'm walking home from work. I used to take these two hour walks home from work. I live 15 minutes, but I turn it into two hours. And I can remember walking past a light pole or whatever, and it had a promotion or someone had plastered a poster on a banner that was like, you want to be paid for your social activism. You want, they were 15 bucks an hour and we can turn you into an activist. And I was like, who would take this and apply for, I go, a crazy person or someone with no options. Someone with a, sh such a criminal history, they can't get any other job. And, and so they can just get paid to sit on social media and spam people. They can get paid to go at rallies, to go to rally, uh, protest rallies and stuff, and do harm to people and be on the front lines. And when I see these people that Andy know, pictures, when I look at the video, I'm just like, I got a job, my friends got jobs, we ain't got time for this. Who has time for this? The unemployed, the people with serious criminal histories that can't get any other place, get jobs anyplace else, and, and pedophiles, the dregs of society, and we won't have this discussion, and it's so obvious and staring us in the face. I'm so glad I asked you this question, because now I don't feel crazy, because other people are seeing the same thing I'm seeing. You just nailed it, and not only that, I can tell you a personal anecdote um, that matches your experience very similarly. So I was in St. Louis last year with Candace Owens and Zuby, and uh, went out, we were doing a speech in St. Louis, which was great. We had over a thousand young uh, Latino and black kids who want to be conservative and it was a beautiful thing. However, we went out to lunch, okay? And just outside of this lunch place, I see on a, on, on a light pole, they've got it pasted on there, this thing for communist action, paying people to be protesters, okay? And it had little things like, like for if they're selling a, a dog or something, you know, those little tear-offs, like they're selling a dog uh, walker or something exactly like that. Exactly what I saw, yes. And it, I was like, this is incredible. I posted it on Twitter. I also took it all down off the light poles and threw them away. But, um, you know, I was like, if that's a crime, then go ahead and lock me up. Because somebody was like, you might not be allowed to do that. I was like, I don't care. I, I don't think Missouri is going to come after me too hard for getting rid of the communist posters. Um, but, you know, as a child of somebody who's, whose family had to, to come and, and flee communism, I, I was personally incensed by this. But you hit it perfectly. They are paying people. And who's going to take money for that type of behavior? Criminals. And so that shouldn't be a surprise that the Democratic Party is closely aligned with criminals. And I just think back to what my uh, bisabuelo, my great grandpa used to tell me. He used to tell me, you are who you hang around. OK, Democratic Party hangs out with criminals. That is who they are. Robbie, thank you so much. I, I really appreciate the conversation. I, I know you're, you're well known, but I feel like I've discovered a piece of gold here right here in Tennessee. And so I appreciate you coming back on the show and we, we will circle back to you. You're a smart man and you, you confirm my, cons my lunatic conspiracy theories. I'm not a lunatic in the conspiracy theories. I'm just someone that's picking up on the obvious signs. Thank you so much. All right, uh, that's Robbie Starbuck. And that's today's show. What You know what? Make sure I get my likes, my 10,000 likes, but I also want you guys in the uh, comments to tell me what you think about, you know, Hadley's adjustments to the show. We, we got more serious towards the end, a little lighter up top. 
what would you think? Or do, you, do you like me just coming out the gates, full blast, fire starter going? Or do you like me building up to it? I just want, I wanna be, I just want 